Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. My name is Gail Snyder. I'm the Executive Director for Dementia Friendly Fort Worth, and we are proud to offer this program in conjunction with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way. These programs are recorded and can be found on a YouTube channel for use at future dates. And today, our guest is Nancy Strickland, and we are going to talk about artist explorers today at the Amon Carter Museum of American Art. Mm -hmm. Nancy, yeah. all it's right. all well, yours. Okay, great. I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint, too. Okay, and I've already given you the okay. authorization to do that. Good morning, okay. Patsy and Joe. Morning. Morning. I'm sorry. I'm muted. <laughs> okay. I'm. I don't need to be doing that right now, though. I just need to be showing you what's right on the wall instead. And let me see if I can get this a little bit bigger so that I can see what I'm showing you a little bit better. Speaker view. I might put it on just for right now. Okay. And nope. Can't do that, or I can't. Okay. Here we go. So. Uh, again, I'm Nancy Strickland. This is the Amon Carter Museum. And in addition to that, uh, that initial collection of Western works that we have, we also have lots of works from, excuse me, from out West. <laughs> um, and so we're looking at landscapes primarily today and um, artists that explored going out West. We're starting here with a scene and I will give you this hint. These are Native Americans. And I'm even going to give you the year. This is 1848. That's just a few years after Texas became a state, but this doesn't look like Texas. What do you notice on the ground? No. Snow. It's a wintry scene. So what do you think? I'll try to get a little closer for you. You can see that these, these men have something in their hands. The one in the brown fringed leather there is reaching over to pick up one. The one in the red there is holding something up high. Can you see what that is? In fact, I can show you a picture of, a close-up picture of that. So let me go back and do that real quick. Right here. Oops. Well, we're buffering here for a minute. Oh, man. <laughs> we may have to stick to what's on the wall. Ah, there it is. Okay, this is what they're holding in their hands. So looking at their movements, I may not want to be going back and forth so much. Because um, I think that will just be a little bit disruptive. So I'm just going to stop the share. Are you looking at the painting now? The same one? No. No, you're not. Okay. There's the stop share. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to stop trying to do that. I won't do that anymore. Okay. So just looking at this, any ideas to what they might be doing here? Throwing rocks. No they might be throwing rocks in those little baskets at the end yep. of the stick. Yeah. You know what? They are throwing rocks, but it's a particular game that we still play today. Now, the American Indians didn't call it by the same name, but you use a stick with a basket and you use some kind of ball. I'm not sure what it's made out of now, but at the time that this was painted, it was made out of a rock, maybe wrapped in leather. It's the lacrosse. Across, you're right. And it was probably French explorers that gave it that name of lacrosse. The uh, Native Americans called it the little brother of war because it was quite a rough and tumble game. Um, you can see that we're, they're running down a frozen river. The name of the painting is Ball Play of the Dakota Sioux on the St. Peter's River in Winter. And they would play over a, over a distance of a few miles sometimes. They'd play at summertime on a field, wintertime on a frozen river, uh, not just it on, uh, in this area of the country, but in other areas of the country too. Over here, you might be able to see, and let me get a little bit further down and a little bit further in. 
or verb. Here are the things that they put down. This is what they're wagering. They're betting here. Oh, I'm, I went the wrong way. Those are, their, those are our spectators there. Let's try it this way. Here we are. So we've got, um, we've got arrows, spears, bucket, a quiver, some animal skins. So they would wager, and this would prepare them, um, maybe physically as well as mentally, for, um, for war between other Native American groups or between those who were coming in and encroaching on their, on their territory. Now, the person that painted this name was Seth Eastman, and he was trained at West Point. He was trained to be a cartographer. He didn't have any particular training in, um, in painting, but you can see that he's very well self-taught. And he was stationed in an area in Minnesota at something that is still, I believe, called Fort Snelling. You may have heard of that. Um, but I do think, I've, I, I met a woman from Minnesota at a conference recently, and she was talking about how there, and this was not recently, recently, maybe a year or two ago, how the, the, it's likely that the name of this fort will be changed from Fort Snelling to its initial name, which was original name which, of the area, which was uh, a Native American word. But anyway, uh, Seth Eastman did paintings um, all over this area, showing the culture of American Indians, and his wife wrote a diary. So she described the things in words that the, both the two of them were seeing. And in fact, our archives here at the Amon Carter Museum has, um, has a copy of the diary that Seth Eastman's wife wrote. So I'm gonna just slip you by real quick and see, oh, wrong way. We're not gonna spend much time with these. They are really hard to see, but this is really one of the earliest artist explorers. His name was George Catlin. And he traveled, you know, many artists that went, that traveled west, let's see if I can stand over here, yeah, that traveled west, um, they were doing it because they were historians as well, and they wanted to capture the culture before it completely disappeared, but they were also trying to make some money. And Catlin tried and tried to sell these paintings to the Smithsonian. Uh, they wouldn't buy them, the, the whole collection, and in fact, he then took them to Europe, and in the middle of the 19th century, Europeans were really interested in looking at these scenes of American Indian life out West. And so he had them there. He, he was really kind of a, he was a, a hardworking artist, but other aspects of his life didn't go as successfully. It's good that he didn't sell the paintings to the Smithsonian because they would have been burned up in a fire that was in the early 1800s. But he lost many of them due to debt and repainted many of them. And in fact, it's likely that the ones we're looking at here are among examples uh, that, that he had re repainted. He showed more skill in others, other works that almost looks like he was in a big rush here. Uh, but we see um, oh yeah, one that is called Bivouac of the Author or Artist. This is supposedly over here by this campfire is uh, George Catlin and his Native American guide. And you can see that a buffalo has trampled through their um, campground there. And that, that supposedly really happened. In fact, the guide was killed in this incident. And I'm going to go up a little bit. This will make you dizzy for a second, but I'll just stay. This one is called, I'm trying to, there we go. Archery of the Apache. Let me go look and make sure. Archery of the Apache, that's right. And um, we're seeing a group of spectators in the middle here. And in fact, one of those spectators is George Catlin. And we know that because one of those spectators is wearing a, a, a top hat on his head, looking very different than, let me see if I can get close enough for you to see that. When I used to do this a long time ago, I had a different camera that I knew how to work a lot better than this one. Nope, that's as close as I can get with this one. But those, those um, <clears throat> American Indians are surrounding the spectators. They're shooting their arrows at targets out away from the spectators. They're practicing for a buffalo hunt. And that is one of the methods that they would use to hunt buffalo, sort of surround a smaller, you know, cordon off a, a smaller group of them and uh, surround them. 
and then shoot in. They had to be close using, using weapons like spears and arrows. Okay, so we've got some American Indian scenes. One more here. These are early explorers. This was painted by an artist whose name was John Mix Stanley. And this one is called Oregon City on the Willamette. Nope, that's not the way you say it. It looks like it should be Willamette. Have any of you been to uh, Oregon City? Willamette, Willamette. The Willamette, no, have... is that what you said? Yes, but I've not yes, been Yes, the Willamette, because, although, wait a second. I did say that right. There was a visitor from this area in the museum once, <laughs> And we were saying Willamette, and she said, it's not Willamette, it's Willamette, damn it. It rhymed. <laughs> That's the way she said the word. So I've been trying to say it like that, but you think it's Willamette. Probably so. It, so it sounds, that sounds better to me, but anyway. So we're looking at Oregon City at the end of the Oregon Trail, and we're looking at uh, something that was painted in 1852. When this was painted, this area had about 300 inhabitants of the newcomers. It had the indigenous people as well. But I'm going to try to get close enough here for you to see that <clears throat> there must be some sort of mill here. This is a logging community. And there's a mill because the structures here, see if I can get any closer, are, are woodworkers, what will we call that, where it's not like a rough hewn log, like a log cabin, but it's smooth wood. Lumber? What do we call that? I don't know. <clears throat> Shingles. Maybe lumber. Anyway, so we've got houses and churches and schools, and a burgeoning community here. Now, let's look at the rest of the painting over here. Am I going the right way? Yes, I am. Right over here, and I'll try to get as close as I can. Wow, this just doesn't get nearly as close. So we've got some Native Americans here, and I'm not a, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see them well enough to respond to this. What do you think the artist's feelings were toward the Native Americans? Think about their placement related to the town that's by the river, and think a little bit about their body language. I know what I'm going to do. I'll do an image. I'll, I'll, I'll show you this with my own body language. So let me pull back out so I don't scare you. So see, he's got them over here. The town is here. They're in the margin, kind of. The man, the uh, male Indian is, let's see, must be a walking stick. He's sort of slumped over a walking stick. The female is down, she sort of has her hand like this, her eyes are downcast. What do you think he's trying to say about what, what's going on in this place? I thought he might be playing a flute. The, the American Indian here? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, it's difficult to see in this way. I don't know, no, you couldn't see it better if I showed you. No, he's not. He's actually just slumped over a walking stick. What's the feeling there? I thought they looked relaxed, actually. I mean, she's sitting, eating with her. I can't see her eyes cast down, but they look pretty relaxed. They look relaxed. They have some belongings with them, too. I can't see that. If you could see their faces. Oh, go ahead, um, Paulette. It, to me, I mean, he's, the, the tribe has lost their land. It, the new people have moved in. They have nothing left. Oh, right. And I think... I mean, that's I, kind of like how I see it. Yes. I think, and the artist, 
uh, well, scholars who have studied this sort of looked at that as that might be the message. If you could see it closer and you could see their expressions, you might be able to see that a little bit better. But in, it's sort of a, it's twofold because he's celebrating the fact that the West is being settled and that we're moving, you know, that idea of manifest destiny and we're moving across the country and settling the West. But he's also lamenting the fact that these people have been pushed out to the margin. They're not as important. So it's not when I said they're here in the margin and we think about that word marginalized, they've been pushed out. So this was part of what he was saying. Um, <clears throat> he's, he uh, traveled west during the Mexican-American War. He also joined um, the, the fight in that war. And so there are some of his paintings from that time. And he actually did end up either selling or exhibiting his paintings at the Smithsonian. And there aren't very many John Nick Stanley paintings to be found because more than 200 of them were burned. There was a fire. You know, now in Washington, D.C., there's all those different buildings that are Smithsonian's. I'm going to assume in 1835, maybe there was just one or two buildings or one, I don't know. But anyway, most of his works were burned in that fire. So it's pretty rare to see a John Mick Stanley. And it, it's, it's one of the few that depicts the Native American alongside the, the, uh, what, what we see with the, a landscape initially or how the landscape was changed by the, the groups that came in. Any comments on that one? Now the next one I'm gonna to have to show you cause it's not on the wall. So I'm gonna to have to show you like this. It's one of my favorite ones. Okay. <coughs> this one is just beautiful. We're not seeing people at all in this one. Mm -hmm. Here's that. Time, edit. Mm -hmm. I wanna just start right here. I can see this one better. I like oh, that. Yes, you can see this one better. Let's see. Slideshow from current slide. Maybe that's the way to. There we go. Nope. Well, that is it too, but I'm going to go ahead and go down to where it is here because it's bigger. Uh, there it is. Oh. And while you're looking at that, I'm going to actually walk across the galleries to another area of the museum. Okay, this is a beautiful place in California. It actually was, was an area that was set aside, not as the first national park, but as the first, I think they called it a pleasure area. That's really not as important as the fact that it was the first protected land and it was protected by the state first and then the federal right. government. Take a look at that. I've got a little bit of a to bring up. There's a little something there. Yeah, bears. Here's the water. Where are they at? This is in California. This is a long, long time ago. This is in the 1800s, probably. Where's Lady Down? That's Gail. Oh. Gail. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. Gail. It's a very nice place. And that, that spot looks very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bear. <laughs> Very pretty. Did we lose our sound? Oh. I've never been, but I've always wanted to. Any ideas? Hmm. Oh, I didn't hear what you said. Something blocked it's your... In, it's in California. Yeah. This. Are and you now, asking? It is a national park now. This is Yosemite mm. Valley. Anybody awesome. been there? Yeah. Mm. Oh. Can you see this? Because I can't yes. see you. Yes, I can, can see it very okay. well. You see the little bear? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can see the bear. I can't see you all anywhere, but that's okay. And there's a rock that looks like another bear. Yes, there is. There's a rock that looks like another bear. I don't know that this is a baby bear. It could be a fully grown bear. Mm -hmm. But placing something like this bear into the composition lets us recognize the enormity of the rest of what's here. You see the cliffs here? This is called Sunrise Yosemite Valley. Yeah. And 
Albert Bierstadt. Uh, first, let's see. This was painted in 1870. He first visited uh, the West in 1858, so quite a bit before that. He eventually wow. made trips in, 1860, in the 1860s and early 70s to this area. Yeah. And actually, by the time he was in this area, um, there, I mean, tourism was already started up. You know, people were already sort of congregating in places like this, maybe even making some changes by the by their presence in places like this. And um, Bierstadt saw this as a garden, as a garden of Eden. He saw it as a as a spiritual place, mm. and he painted it over and over again. And some people did not particularly well. For one thing, people thought he exaggerated the color and the size and so forth. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Think there's exaggeration? No. No. I don't. I think it's just very beautiful. It, it mm -hmm. is almost like it was actual an actual photo. It looks so realistic. Like mm -hmm. it's all right. right. Very right. accurate. Mm -hmm. Do you it's think it's beautiful. sunrise or sunset? Well, it's time. It's titled Sunrise, and the, you know that's an interesting question. And I've asked that question a lot. When you know we 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 don't know from the title, but what what other colors do you think we'd see a bit more of if it were a sunset? We see where? What other colors do you think we'd see a bit more of if it were sunset instead of red. sunrise? Orange. We'd see more reds and oranges probably if it was sunset. But I just think it's beautiful. The mountains and the winding. It's like a photograph. But it's the bear. And right here, I know you really would have trouble seeing this, but right here is a little animal skull. And he's kind of letting us know, you know, this is, this is wild. There's wildness here. This is nature um, in, a, in the raw kind of, it looks very untouched. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments on this one? No, it's, I love beer stat. I think this one is beautiful. <laughs> you know, some of them, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take this off of the screen share now. Just don't understand. I'm having trouble. Okay. Me. <laughs> Pause share. We'll try that and see what happens. Can you see me again? Mm -hmm. okay. Oops, oops, oops. I want to look at what's behind us now and not look at there we go. We're going to look at the real deal instead of the picture of the next one. Uh, this is this may be one. This may be my favorite. I think just because there's so many fun stories about it. Let me get get it so you can see it. So, ah, this is not far. Well, no, no, no. That's not right. <laughs> this is totally far from where Yosemite Valley is. This is called the Cliffs of Green River. Now, let me get really close so you can see what right here in the center. Look at that. We have this lone rider here. If I could, if I could get any closer, you could recognize by the way he's dressed that this is a Native American. Back here, following him, over there, but over here. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, these are likely a depiction, this is likely a depiction of explorers because of the way they're dressed rather than other Native Americans. So we have a Native American guide. He's kind of separated from the other group. And then they're going through this beautiful, um, River, let me pull out a little bit. That is being towered over by these gorgeous yellow cliffs. Now, where do we see all this yellow stone? Yellowstone. Yeah, in Yellowstone. And actually, this place is not part of Yellowstone, but it is in uh, southern Wyoming. And the artist Thomas Moran um, painted this, let's see, painted this in 1874. But prior to that, in 1871, Thomas Moran joined a U.S. geological survey team 
And he did go and survey, oops, wrong button. He did go and survey the area that is now Yellowstone National Park. And it was in fact so that, uh, in fact, the, the, it was the Hayden Expedition and they were granted um, the funds and the authority to go and explore this area and um, uh, learn about the resources in the area, learn the best routes for railroads in the area, um, the best way to protect the area and so forth from, from all kinds of things. I guess also the best way to, they were, they were learning about the, uh, the uh, indigenous inhabitants there with the idea of maybe moving them off. Uh, this particular area where this structure is right there, it looks like a pyramid. That rock almost looks like a pyramid. That's called Castle Rock. And it was initially a spot on that river where trappers met and exchanged goods um, for money or other goods or whatever, exchanged their, um, their the skins that they'd gotten. And so... Kind of confused myself there for just a second. So this being in the southern part of Wyoming is not Yellowstone, but he, Moran went to Yellowstone also, and the the pictures that he painted, the watercolors that he did at the time, and some photographs that were taken by the photographer on the exhibition, whose name was um, Henry Jackson. Just a minute. His name was William Henry Jackson. Um, those things put together with a description of this area are what, what uh, pushed Congress toward naming this the first national park. And when we think about that, it wasn't just the first national park in the United States. It was the, a whole new concept of a governmental entity taking care of, of lands. And, and the land in, in America was as prized as the castles in Europe. What we had were this beautiful landscape. So it was a pretty interesting concept. But anyway, then he was back again and he, he went to this place more than one time. On this trip, he had gone uh, at the direction of the railroad and he was, the railroad wanted him to go and do these beautiful images showing the landscape, showing it natural as if it wasn't touched by man at all showing it at a time that has a Native American guide bringing in these explorers from the outside. But I wanted to tell you something interesting and I have to go back to the screen share to show you this. So we'll hope we can go here and maybe then just go one more slide. You can see it maybe a little bit better there. And we'll go one more slide Oops, I can go one more slide. Let's try this. Ah, there it is. This is a photograph taken by a photographer at about the same time that Thomas Moran was there. And you can see Castle Rock right here. Oops, I need to point like this. I'm pointing behind me. You can see it right here. It's the same structure. This is a lot closer, moved in a lot closer. We don't actually have something completely natural. The river's back here. But what do we already have here? Railroad. We got the railroad there. But if he had painted it like this, which one of these images, let me see if I can go back right there, which one would make you want to visit? This one. this one. This one would make us want to visit rather than this one. I just think that's so interesting. So he's using his artistic license for sure and making choices and showing this place to us in a more natural, natural way. And then, you know, just thinking about it too with photographs, and I'm going to go on real quickly and show you a couple of other photographs from out west. Um, we don't get the full impact because they're black and white. I mentioned the photographer um, William Henry Jackson. This is uh, a geyser in Yellowstone National Park. Can you imagine those explorers first seeing those geysers? I'm sure they just, uh, it's unimaginable what they would have thought. It would have been so amazing. But Jackson took a picture of this geyser and many other pictures of those scenes 
And his story is so interesting. I just wanted to tell you a little bit. Look at this camera. We talked last week about cameras. Look at this. If he's going to take a, a photograph, say, that is going to be like, oh, say, three feet by three and a half, maybe, then he's going to need a wooden camera that big and glass plates to put inside. And this man did all those travels for his most of his life and lived uh, into his 90s lived a long, long time. And then one more I wanted to show you. Ah, uh, this is him carrying that camera. Oh my God. Yeah, with his mule hypo, with 300 pounds of equipment and chemicals. This is his dark room. So these explorers, you know, we, we had our painters and, and our painters, um, you know, they, they took, they were not doing oil paintings out on plein air like we talked about when we talked about American Impressionism. They were doing watercolor sketches, which to me were, they look like beautiful paintings as well, but they would do color notes and sketches and then go back from their memory or even looking at photographs. They do notes with their watercolors and th those of you that we talked last time There's that are- a lot of noise, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Is, is someone adding something or just speaking with someone in the room? Just speaking with someone. I'll oh. mute. Oh, no, no, no. That's fine. That's fine, Mary Jane. I, anyway. I could add something. Pardon? Okay. I could add something about yes. the Paiute Indians. I just okay. thought this was so beautiful when I read it. They thought that if you were a gay person, you were doubly blessed because you could walk in the soul of a man and the soul of a woman simultaneously. Wow. So they thought gay people were doubly blessed. And I just I think that's so oh, okay. I, just love, I love it. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Thank you for adding that. Anybody I, else, before I have to scoot off to my meeting, want to add anything? I hope you enjoyed this. It's a little bit rougher when you're looking at the real thing, but you do get to see the whole gallery. And I was going to walk over here with you and let you see this because we're talking about explorers. This was the exhibition that was in place when the museum had to close back in March. And it was so unique. This was part of the exhibition. This was one piece, one thing. So look at this. Let me back up now so you can see. It's a beautiful cabinet. So what the, the Eamon Carter commissioned, and I'm not behind where I'm supposed to be, so I'm putting my mask on. The Eamon Carter commissioned um, an artist whose name is Mark Dion to travel through Texas for a couple of years. And he followed the route of other Texas explorers from the last century, not the 20th century, from the 19th century. And he just collected things and he collected thousands of things that some people might think, well, why would you ever pick that up? But, but he did. Let me get a little closer so you can see all this. And to me, it's, it's, it's just as interesting to think about it as a whole and think about those beautiful shapes and colors. I'll move in a little bit. Well, that's as far as I can move in with this camera. To think about all that is to think about the individual objects. There are, there are shells and pieces of iron and mesquite tree beans in jars and animals in jars and test tubes full of different kinds of dirt and soil and all of that. Anyway, it was kind of, it was sad that our, the public couldn't come in and see that for most of its show. So we've left this and it makes sense to me, we've left it in our landscape galleries because this was his interpretation of how you capture a culture and a place like our early artist explorers did. Okay, uh, I guess I'll Very see you next time I see you. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Thank you so Thank you. much for taking the time to be with us today. We've really enjoyed your presentation about artist explorers, and we'll look forward to you being with us again soon. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you Nancy. So does anybody have any other comments they'd like to add about the session today? I know Nancy has to cut out real quickly, but any Makes thoughts sense. you want to add? I would like to go to the museum. <laughs> yes, it makes you want to go, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Joe, what were you saying? Oh, I just think it's all very good. I love this. And, you know, I look at pictures maybe differently to see the, the, what the lady does, but that, you know, it's, it's good to get to the real meaning. You know, and and to uh, recognize yeah. what other people might see in the painting right. that we don't. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we noticed last time that Nancy yeah. was with us is that sometimes something stands out to one person that the other that another person might not see at the first. Right. So it's mm -hmm. interesting to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. So um, I have just shared with you in the chat the link. If you're interested in joining us at the Fifth Street Cafe, and we probably will continue talking about art for a few minutes. We don't have a specific agenda for that meeting, but it's a chance for us to extend our conversation about this session or anything else we want to talk about. So all you have to do is to click on that link and join me in that meeting, and I'll transition over so some of you might beat me there. <laughs> And then I also want to remind you that tomorrow we will meet again at 1030 and Brooke Wood with Civitas Senior Living will be helping us with our activity tomorrow. And I don't know yet what she's going to do, so it will be a surprise, but I'll send it out in the morning like I always do so that you'll know if it's something you're really interested in. And... You all have a wonderful day, and I hope to see some of you over in the other room Thank in a few you minutes. Thank you so much, Gail. Good to see everybody. Yeah.